KATU in the spirit of the Northwest presents the wild winter of 95-96. In Clackamas County, rivers ran wild. Dangerously flooded roadways. We're staying put. We've got nowhere else to go. This is the closest I have ever seen to a hurricane. The brewing cauldron out here. It is an incredible sight today. The ice was half an inch thick in spots. We expect three to six inches of rain over the next few days. This is normally just a little runoff bit. I guess it's going to get roof. Look at it, it's hard. It goes clear to the river, which is a quarter mile that way. The biggest body of it, the most important part, is done. <laughs> How do you thank them? How, how do you thank these people? A truly wild winter in the Northwest, from Southwest Washington to Portland and the Willamette Valley and the coast, one we won't forget around here for a long time. With all that happened, it's easy to forget when it all started. Late November, record rain and floods, and then our first ice storm of the season. Here's a look at the beginning, November 28th, 1995. In Clackamas County, rivers ran wild. And while most of us slept, the storm's intimidating rain forced people who lived along the banks from their homes. I had to worry about getting our kids out. <laughs> you know, and we've got two small children that this has been the only home they've ever known. You might call this the Salmon Creek Falls, but this is supposed to be Northeast 156th Street. The flood forced motorists to navigate dangerously flooded roadways. This is surprising that we have this much water with just, you know, with 24 hours of rain. The Zigzag River had already taken part of Carol Wasson's home. Today, it came back for more. In the darkness of the early morning, neighbors heard the frightening sounds as the house was ripped apart. Locals say the Clackamas has only been higher once, in December of 1964, when homes were lost and farmlands ruined. Tony and Terry Herbeck are one of eight families evacuated from the Eagle Creek area. The main road to their home became a canal. The trucks are rolling in and huge rocks are rolling into the river to protect Ann Crockett's home and two others. Joy Smith is heading up this project. She's been working in this area for more than 40 years and she knows when to fight Mother Nature and when to watch out. I'm uh, in awe of it. Uh, every time water doubles its size, it increases its physical force 32 times. The heavy rainfall sent mud, rocks, and logs cascading down the hillsides, cutting off dozens of cars. The problem area is on Highway 6 near Tillamook. We start our team coverage from there with Mark Hass. Mother Nature bore hundreds of new waterfalls in the coast range last night, but they washed logs, mud, and rock across major arterials, including three places on the Wilson River Highway. Two dozen motorists were trapped between slides and were forced to spend the night in their cars. The slide looked like it was about 50. One slide broke slide. across the highway right in front of Dan Scott and his family. We come through and missed, this slide missed from hitting us by about two minutes. Just went through and somebody turned around and come back and tried to get out and said there was a slide there, blocked the whole road.
A Coast Guard chopper stood by to evacuate, but lowlanders, even at this RV park, were resigned to hold their ground. The ice catch. We're staying put. We've got nowhere else to go. And then I'll be packing more little things in around now. Meanwhile, the Herbecks put their life's possessions into a small trailer. This is everything I own right here, everything I own. The family will watch the weather like everyone else who lives along the Clackamas and pray for an end to this intimidating rain. They told us to evacuate because the water's coming up. Record rain and warm temperatures melting mountain snows have swollen the Cowlitz River over its banks. Some residents of nearby Toledo are also being asked to leave. Hi. U.S. Geological Survey crews say the flood on the Cowlitz River should peak around 10 o'clock tonight. If there's too much, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> There's not much you can go about it. You just uh, kind of watch it and admire it and, you know, just be thankful that I don't have a house up here somewhere. For those that do have homes, putting furniture on blocks and taking what they feel they can't live without is all there's time for. High water isn't the only danger facing houseboats on the Willamette. That could be a tree hanging upside down. Manager Kevin Cloudy watches debris come straight toward his moorage. Listen as a huge tree slams into one houseboat. Like right under. It's going to bounce off. That's been freshly ripped out of the ground, too. This time, the danger passes. This isn't the kind of water you wade through. The cars found that out the hard way. I'm not going in. I don't care. Oh. It's only by boat that Paul Carp can see the damage. I didn't fathom that it would be inundated to that degree. The water hasn't hit the second floor of their home yet, but everything on the first floor is either floating or sunk. It's terribly traumatic, and it's the thoughts of trying to replace all those goods uh, are are. It seem insurmountable. A sentimental house decoration is all that Carr can get to, but their children are safe and happy to have their pet rabbits out of the house, and that's what gives Carr strength during this difficult time. You have to draw strength from that and say, we can go on from there. Uh, we got the things over time, we will get more things over time. But only time will tell when and if the creek will give these homes back to these families. Cold, icy weather takes its toll on our area. Ice topples a tree into a home in Troutdale this morning. Quite a mess outside. Piece of ceiling come, drop on me, and I was just buried in all this insulation. But the storm also caused havoc for travelers along 257th in Troutdale. Drivers found themselves stranded as they failed to make it up the hill. Along I-84, truckers and motorists lined the freeway as they chained up to handle the ice and blowing snow. Snow plows soon work their way along the freeway, clearing the snow drifts that have accumulated here. You can see what I'm talking about over here. Take a look at this power pole and uh, the kind of thick ice we're talking about here. It must be one and a half, two inches thick, still solid despite the weather reports of melting. Perhaps the biggest inconvenience, the shutdown of the Sunset Highway. But the sun definitely didn't shine and the ice was half an inch thick in spots. And more than a dozen stranded drivers spent the night at a Sylvan convenience store. Joseph Jones said he and the others tried to pass the time with humor. Trading stories of, so, where's your car stuck? And Joseph Jones got his Volvo back after 10 and a half hours at a convenience store. Life is good. Floods and ice, that was just the start. We barely caught our breath before a windstorm like many folks in the Northwest have never seen before swept through Oregon and Washington. You have to go back to Columbus Day 1962 to compare. But from now on, we'll all remember December 12, 1995. 
this may be the beat of the storm. We are seeing winds gusting up to 90 miles an hour. We have torrential rain coming down, power lines going down all over the town of Newport, and it does appear that it's happening right now in terms of the real seriousness of this storm. Sustained winds of 74 miles an hour or better, and those are hurricane strength winds. You'll see this big structure at the BP going around. It looks like a, an amusement park ride. The wind's just playing with it needlessly until finally it actually ended up on the floor, just exactly where everybody expected it would be. It was a very, very intense day. I, I would say this is the closest I have ever seen to a hurricane. Here's a picture of Izzy's restaurant. The very top of that is, is what blew off. Kind of concerned when we had the Columbus Day storm, there was power outages for five to seven days. Television was virtually useless because of that. So I'm wondering what's going to happen in the days ahead. Jeff Dinoli, you have something new for us here in the newsroom? Well, this could be very serious. We have a report that the dock broke loose at 33rd and Marine Drive. Well, here we are. <laughs> We've kind of been following the situation unfold. These boats, uh, approximately 40 of them, came across from 33rd and Marine Drive to uh, about a mile upriver from the Interstate Bridge. We've been watching these boats, and sure enough, well, as you can see, one right here, about a oh, 22, 25 footer, is it just about to go under. We've confirmed three other boats that did sink on their way across the Columbia River, and uh, <laughs> we, we think we see the mast of another one just off the dock down here. Several people down here trying to unload their boats and, and get them off, get their belongings off. It's a very dangerous situation, as we've already pointed out to you. You see people walking around here without life vests on, which to me seems absolutely incredible, considering how rough that water is out there. I mean, one false step and you're in the drink and you're a goner. There's, there's no two ways about it. It's a very dangerous situation. We can't stress that enough and we sure encourage people not to come down here. I've spent a good many years out here fishing and recreating along, its, along this riverway. I have never seen the kind of turmoil, the kind of uh, the cauldron, the brewing cauldron out here. It is an incredible sight today. I can guarantee you that uh, that will not be the last boat that goes down here tonight either. Judging from the, the uh, pitching and rolling that we're seeing on some of these other boats, literally uh, the bows have come up out of the water and dip right down, decks awash. Stuff that you see in the street, it came off the top of the Port of Portland building that's 17 floors. Happened about a half an hour ago, a woman I talked to said that she was in a conference room in a meeting and all of a sudden they heard this huge crash, looked out the window and saw the stuff fall over. Now it hit a lamp, they blocked off traffic on either side so you have to be careful if you're going to come across anywhere around uh, the Lloyd Center area, and as you can tell, the wind is really starting to whip up. We're at Wilsonville Primary off of Boone's Ferry Road, and earlier today, even last night, schools were canceling schools, telling kids to go home early. Well, here is a graphic demonstration. Right here behind me, there used to be a roof. Nothing but sky now. This used to be a play area. Typically on a rainy day, kids would be out here doing their recess. But today, fortunately, the kids were in. You can see the roof over there, about a 60-foot roof, now completely splintered. A tree was blown over in addition to the roof. A very scary scene here. The kids were here in school, but fortunately, nobody was outside. No one was hurt. The highest reported wind gust in the last hour here in Portland was 61 miles per hour with sustained winds at 43 miles per hour. All of a sudden, I heard a boom, and the window broke downstairs. The door was open, and the window, there was no wall, no window. My bed sticking outside. It was scary. I've never seen anything like that before, and my first reaction was I knew there was people inside the apartment, and they can't see it, and I did. Um, right now, I'm glad that everybody's outside where it's safe. But everybody's pulled together so much, and everything's going to be okay. I have activated the emergency alert system and I'm advising all storm affected residents to seek permanent shelter. Uh, we are uh, this evening uh, declaring a, a state of emergency in western Oregon. And look at those parking, Julie, listen to that 
Listen to that noise as that marks. This is where the wind literally snapped that tree. This shows you the wind's power snapping the tree down. This was not the whole roots just being loosened from the rain, but this is where the wind literally took this tree as if it were a matchstick and broke it. Captured that on film. Oh my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh now we've got a view of Mount St. Helens. Oh. Oh my Boy, they're going down like 10 pins around okay, here. Okay, here's the latest video coming into the Channel 2 newsroom. This was a home video now of a home fire in Lake Grove in Lake Oswego there on Twin for a drive. We're not exactly sure what happened, but it's definitely weather related. This is a house fire. When a tree fell into a home, somehow that started a fire. That's the first fire, Julie. Earlier you mentioned we haven't had a lot of reports of any fires or anything, but that's the first fire we're reporting. And I'm surprised that there hasn't been more of this. You mentioned that earlier with all the trees and power lines that are going down. I'm really surprised we haven't seen more fires. One of the strangest uh, incidents we had was a tree into a home and a woman could have got injured, but she was apparently in her bathroom and she looked up, Julie, and she saw in the skylight this tree starting to fall. She got out of the bathroom and the tree came in and look where that limb ended up, right in the bathroom of this massive tree falling, falling on this house. And look at the limb that came right in there. But she managed to escape because she saw it falling through the skylight. <laughs> you were sitting right here, huh? doing saw, your job in the bathroom. I saw it coming, and I mean to tell you, it was so scary. <laughs> it didn't make a sound until it hit the house. <laughs> and you were sitting there when that came through there, huh? Mm -hmm. Did no, it hit you? actually, uh, I wasn't. I, by the time that came through, I was headed out the door. Oh, I gotta get this done. Get all this. Wow. There, there you go. There's the skylight. One of the advantages, I guess, of having a skylight in your bathroom, uh, you can see what's falling. And like Chicken Little, you can see that the sky is literally falling on you. It didn't even hurt the sky. Dan Christopher is in Beaverton right now. Dan, uh, give us a rundown of some of the damage there. Well, Julie, it's been a long, long time since I've seen the kind of damage that we surveyed this afternoon, even in a single neighborhood, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage. One area in particular is called Hardwood Highlands. It's a housing development. Most of the houses built in the mid-1970s. A tall stand of fir trees uh, is uh, surrounding all of the homes, except tonight, the big difference is that there are so many of those 60, 70, 80, 90 feet, foot fir trees that have collapsed crashed through roofs they have uh, wiped out uh, buildings one thing and another the uh, patios in the back of one house we saw was just completely upended there were cars that became uh, victims of some of the uh, fallen trees in one particular case we talked to a seven-year-old boy his name was Dylan he was upstairs the second floor of a uh, home that was uh, the victim of a tree as he was playing one of these towering trees came thundering through the roof as he was there, he thought for sure that he was going to die. He was a very, very frightened little boy, and we are happy to say that he got out safely, although it's not uh, a good situation as far as his home is concerned or so many of the other homes around here. Well, dozens of power outages reported tonight. Paula Gunnis is standing by at a power outage in East Moreland tonight. Paula, what's your exact location? Jeff, I'm at uh, Southeast 32nd and Woodstock. In fact, it's raining so hard I can't really even see the camera, but we did want to show you this. This has really made a mess of this neighborhood. This is a down transformer, and I don't know, Corky, can you show the end of the power line there? Look at how it's jagged. And then if we can, we want to show you where this came from. This came from right up there. That's where it broke off across the street. And luckily, it didn't fall into the street. And a power crew has been over here working. But as you can see, all the houses in this area are dark. People are home tonight. You can see the little candles flickering the area. This okay. is the Laurelhurst area. We're inside the home of Dale and Kay Haney. These pictures taken just moments ago and they're doing what thousands of folks across Western Oregon are doing tonight. They're living with flashlights and candles. We're going to show you how this family is spending the evening here without power. Come on this way into the family kitchen. And this is the Wells family. They're enjoying a game of Scrabble. Quality family time together. Yeah. When else would we all be in the same room doing the same thing? When otherwise, we'd be scattered around in several different rooms doing a bunch of different things. 
A new day dawns, revealing what was left behind by yesterday's winds of destruction. They stood tall for decades, but now thousands of huge trees have been ripped out of the ground by their roots. Residents must manage without the necessities of life. No power, no water, no roof over their head. No, we have no water, no power. I have no phone, no nothing. Tonight, the Northwest is heading down the road to recovery from the big storm. Force of 100 mile an hour winds took this roof off the Vista Villa apartments in Vancouver. Residents say watching the roof blow reminded them of a Judy Garland movie. Wizard of Oz it was just like that, just raised up and just went like that and I just screamed. It seemed like the rooftop would have stayed airborne if it hadn't been for this tree. That's the gutter still hanging off of a branch. Oh yeah, it looked like it was snowing. It was snowing yellow and white insulation everywhere. Well, come on, on down to the bedroom and I'll show you what I found when I came home yesterday. This tree, at least a yard in diameter, planted itself in this bedroom. Luckily, no one was home at the time. The Thompsons just finished remodeling the outside of their Brush Prairie home. This is a change they definitely didn't count on. Oh, and our other room, if I can get our door open. What's left? Looks like they'll have to leave their home, but Debbie Thompson says no matter what happens with the house, she'll never leave her neighbors. They're the ones who put the tarps up that help keep some of the rain out. And I have never been in such a great neighborhood. We owe these people a lot, <laughs> a whole lot. Uh, as Barbara mentioned, massive power outages to be blamed up and down the coast specifically, but we can tell you there is light at the end of the tunnel. All Pacific Power customers in the Portland area should have power tonight, and the news is encouraging for PGE customers as well. At the peak of the storm last night, more than 300,000 PGE homes were without power. It will be another three to four days, though, before all power is restored. The fact that the damage happened all at once has utility companies scrambling to make repairs, and the outage has left some businesses in the lurch. <laughs> The Zupan's market at Northwest 23rd and Burnside has to throw away tons of food because the power didn't come back on in time. So the fresh juice has gone stale. So is the meat. The dairy products, juices, and frozen foods. They're all getting dumped. Power companies are asking people to hang tough and hang tight because some of these repairs are tricky and dangerous. The weather has been a little tough, but we hang in there. I gotta go answer the radio. Okay. And you can see where the tree snapped off and came through the roof and took out that wall. Yeah. Kathleen Marriott takes her insurance agent on a tour of what's left of her home now that an 80-year-old fir tree has rearranged the place. I was worried about my deductible. I was worried about affording the hotel. I was worried about what they, they cover in terms of the damage. Is there a limit on it? That's what I'm here to do is calm them down, reassure them that they have coverage and what we're going to do for them under the policy and guide them. Obviously, this big fir tree has created a lot of damage here at the Marriott's house, but it's also affected their neighbors. Some of the branches came down, took down the trusses over here and the gutters, but it will be the neighbor's insurance that will pick up the repair tab for this home, not the Marriott's. And remember all those flattened cars? Well, the car owners better hope they have comprehensive insurance because the property owner is not responsible for the damage. But back at the Marriott's, everything's settled. The owners will spend the next several days in a motel while their home is repaired. There you go. Great. $750. Thank you. And State Farm will be picking up the tab for everything except a $250 deductible. And to give you an idea of the great expense of this storm, Farmers Insurance alone says they expect more than 6,000 storm-related claims at a cost of more than $12 million, just one insurance company. Signs of the storm are everywhere. Imagine the horror of sitting in a pizza parlor when the entire roof blows off. We noticed at the far corner of the building, the roof started to raise it up just a little bit on the outside to a covered patio. And we never thought that the whole roof was going to come off. And all of a sudden, it just exploded and it was gone. Food still sits where about a dozen customers were eating before taking cover under tables. Had they ran out the door to their cars, they may not be alive to tell their story. We were just about ready to get in it, and we, for some unknown reason, we sort of hesitated. 
And uh, when we did, we heard this big boom, and the roof was gone, and we came out here, and all these cars were crushed. An ambulance was completely crushed when paramedics stopped to clear debris from Highway 20 east of Newport. A fellow paramedic says they got out just in time. Had just started to walk away from the vehicle. Someone yelled, look out. He turned around and just in time to see this tree crush his ambulance. As the terror from the storm begins to wear off, the tragedy of the devastation soaks in. This couple says they might have died had they not gotten out of their fifth wheel home before it flipped over. I don't know, it's the only thing I got in the world, man, and it's gone. And we all got scared. We was gonna just ride the storm out. We thought we were, you know, tough guys. The toughest problem now is getting power restored. More than a third of coastal towns around Newport are still without it. Somehow, most of the area's telephone service is still working. And when the roof came across, they knocked down three poles, took all the cables out, but they're still working, thank God. Thanks is what many coastal families are giving tonight as they continue to dig out from the storm that's uprooted their lives. Country folks in remote areas are facing big challenges in day-to-day -day life today. Grant McCombie traveled through rural Washington County to see how some are coping with no power, no phones, and no water. Forest Grove utility workers clear trees and debris off power lines so the electricity can be turned back on. At Pacific University, six huge trees crashed into buildings and across the campus, but haven't prevented students from finding a path toward higher learning. The college reopened today. In the nearby rain-soaked countryside, Washington County's rural residents are just beginning to live with the fact they have no power. Mike Hundley loves the view of his 18 acres from this huge deck, but yesterday he worried the winds would carry it right into his house. Now without power, he can't pump water from his well, so jugs of water will have to do, and he says that could last three more days. This is definitely the price you pay for living in the, in the country, but when you live in the country, you just don't have, you're on your own when something like this happens. You just have to use good common sense. In some cases, it's a matter of too much water. Here near Gaston, Oregon, where they've been without power since the storm hit, waterlogged trees have just laid down on the power lines. PGE crews continue working around the clock to bring the lights back on, but local flooding hasn't helped them. Swollen creeks lap at many doorsteps, and it'll be quite a while before anyone takes a swing at the local ball field. All of this has left many feeling like they've been hit with a one-two punch. Still, many aren't ready to throw in the towel. Dilly resident Liz Jordan says the inconvenience of cooking and lighting with camping gear does take some getting used to, but she sees a silver lining in the dark storm clouds. Well, it's kind of nice not to have the television on, everybody not, we're actually talking to each other and playing games and reading. I think my daughter actually got her homework done last night. <laughs> That's a sense of humor that may well be tested in the days to come. Near Dilly, Oregon, Grant McComey, Channel 2 News. An aerial tour starting at the coast. And stretching to the Willamette Valley shows off the incredible damage from yesterday's big blow. Governor John Kitzhaber has now had a first-hand look at the storm devastation along the Oregon coast specifically. A Channel 2 News crew rode along with the governor as he took an aerial tour of the coast aboard the Air National Guard plane. The governor also toured heavily damaged areas on foot and visited with troops helping clear Oregon coastal highways. The governor says his office is hard at work on a statewide damage estimate and that a request for federal disaster assistance is likely. and I could tell that the tree was going to go. If you have a tree down in your yard, you're responsible for having it removed. If the tree is an elm tree, do not keep the logs for firewood. You're supposed to call the city to come and collect the wood. This is state law because officials are worried the beetle that causes Dutch elm disease might be in the bark. Drive down almost any street and you'll see a tree uprooted in someone's yard and meet a homeowner faced with doing something about it. Yeah, because somebody that. said since it's not on the other side of the uh, sidewalk, I have to pay for it. And it'll cost Cedrice Phillips. 
Um, somebody came over and told me that they would come cut it down like two fifty, so I'll probably end up having to pay two fifty and get it um, cut up. The city doesn't charge to saw up trees that are creating public hazards, like this elm that fell across Northeast 20th and Irving. But homeowners are responsible if the tree is on their property. City tree experts say it's best to hire a reputable tree service and not do it yourself. If you want to tackle it yourself, uh, you are taking some risks. Uh, it's dangerous work. Uh, trees twist and turn, and a lot of them are under pressure uh, from the way they fell. It hits the ground, it's quarantined. If your tree is an elm, state law says you can't keep the logs for firewood. The reason? A deadly tree disease. One of the insects that passes the Dutch elm disease harbors in the bark of the wood here, and so um, it's just a, a eliminating a chance that we might infect another tree. You can see removing trees is not only a dangerous, but delicate business. The experts say don't be in a hurry to hire the first tree service that comes knocking. Ask for references and check them out. Back here where we were earlier, you can see that that's all that's left of the tree and of the car that was smashed by the tree. The city says be patient. There are lots of trees out there. They're still assessing the situation. They will come if the tree is in the street, but if it's on your property, remember, it's up to you. And as you can see back here, we have about 21 trees that have fallen on our property. We just have to start cleaning up now. I think it'll take us probably a year to clean up. <laughs> Earlier today, we took to the air to see just how bad it really is. The view from above reveals mass destruction throughout our region. This is Bull Mountain, where trees litter the ground like matchsticks. Take a look at this house along the Tualatin River. Trees cover it like a blanket. A fly over the coast provides a dramatic view of a mudslide that's closed Highway 101 near Manzanita. Just as dramatic, the destruction in Newport, where the gas station canopy remains on its side. The Izzy's restaurant has no roof. Governor John Kitzhaber also took to the air today to survey the damage along the coast. He's already declared the region a disaster area. Now he says his office is hard at work on a statewide damage estimate and that a request for federal disaster assistance is likely. Take a look at these dramatic pictures from southwest Portland. The driveway of this home was turned into a bridge from the street to the garage. The earth underneath the driveway washed away during the storm, leaving a huge empty space below. The homeowners have roped off the driveway as a precaution. People living on Sovi Island had double trouble from the storm. The wind knocked out electricity, which means residents there can't get water out of their wells. Owners of this dog kennel were gathering water from storm drains to give the animals uh, water boarded there. Humans there are relying on bottled water. They're also coping with cleaning up the mess made from downed oak trees on their property. And one resident tells us an adult foster home on Sovi Island has been hit especially hard with no power or water. Well, one of the most dramatic examples of the storm's destruction was was the fiery explosion of a Lake Oswego home. Sheila Hamilton talked to two families and a neighbor who say a Lake Oswego city worker saved their lives. Today, it is a pile of charred wood, a devastating scene of disaster. But yesterday, this was home to two families, Rebecca Williams, her baby daughter, and her parents. The Lake Oswego house burst into a wall of flames and collapsed on the front lawn. It was less than two minutes after a Lake Oswego city worker smelled gas and cleared the Williams to safety. Williams says this huge tree had blown over, pulling the gas main from the home. Maintenance worker Wayne Benson pulled people to safety, then went back to the home to turn off the gas. I'm sure that he didn't really think about how much his life was at risk. He did save those people in the house there because if he hadn't gone and told them, get out of there, it's going to blow, they would have been inside. As Benson turned a wrench on the gas, a power line sparked, and the house erupted into a ball of fire. It's kind of like being in the mouth of a volcano. Benson is in the hospital with burns to his face you know, and lungs. Turned... Just, you know, I'm a guy that was doing his job, and that's the way I've been my whole life, is if I see, you know, something bad happening, I'll step in and try to, try to change it. Burned into his mind is the image of Rebecca carrying her 15-month-old baby to safety. Now that I think about it, I remember, you know, I have a 10-month-old daughter. And um, 
I could. I hope somebody would do the same for my family if um, in that situation. If there's anything good that can come from a tragedy like this one, it's watching how people pull together. Already, Rebecca has had offers for a place to live and food and clothing for her 15-month-old child. But the biggest gift came from Wayne Benson, a man who risked his life to save others. Thank you, and we'll be in touch. <laughs> um, we will be getting in touch with him, because I would really like to tell him personally, just if it weren't for him, you know, we might not be here. So. Well, you'd think it'd be hard to top those pictures and stories, but not in this wild winter. By mid-January, the weather took another turn. Snow, cold ice, and then rain, all combining to create the worst flooding in the Northwest in more than 30 years. We'll pick things up January 18th with a surprise snow. Clark County around lunchtime and in about 30 minutes an inch had already stuck to the ground. A familiar sound on West Burnside as falling snow piled up and packed down leaving nothing but thick ice on the steep road. The weather was also tough on pedestrians. It isn't too comfortable walking around in the cold slush, especially if you were like many who didn't know what was coming and really weren't prepared. Everybody's just stopped all the way through to downtown. I've been on the road here since uh, 11 o'clock. And Warden wasn't the only one. Despite the bumper sticker, these folks weren't going anywhere. Uh, I was hoping you'd come help me. <laughs> Uh, the traffic stopped and I don't, I have rear-wheel drive. No chains. Stupid woman driver. <laughs> On a normal work day, Pioneer Courthouse Square and the rest of downtown Portland would have been full of people. So some say it's good that this snowstorm hit on a weekend. <laughs> For some, fun in the snow meant a good cardiovascular workout. White flakes began falling before sunrise, and by the time most people began to stir, roads were blanketed with several inches of snow. It created a slippery problem for some drivers who ignored the state police's warning to stay home unless absolutely necessary. It was slow going on the Banfield as well, and again, more semi-trucks blocked the path. This is the problem. Heavy, snow-laden trees and branches falling and then snapping power lines. It happened all over Portland today. BGE says at one point, 50,000 homes were without power. In northeast Portland, this tree toppled when the ground gave way under the weight of the wet, heavy snow on the limbs. Commented to my daughter, it sounded like some branches on somebody's roof. I hoped it wasn't mine, <laughs> but it turned out to be worse than that. Edmund not only lost a tree, but his company van. Neighbors pitched in to help remove the big Doug fir and clear the street. It was also slow going on 205 at Clackamas, forcing many to chain up. Frankly, I don't have a whole lot of experience driving in the snow. In Milwaukee, one driver got all the experience he could handle and more. I wasn't going that fast, you know, maybe 40 miles an hour, but it's all it takes. And for this guy, getting around on a set of motorized skis was the way to go. But Portlanders weren't the only ones having a rip-roaring time. Plenty of four-legged friends were out and about getting their little feet wet. These boys not only built a snowman, but thanks to a little flavored syrup, ate him. A masterpiece. <laughs> devoured. You know what? On Highway 26 near Sandy, cars like this one left on its top reminded other motorists to drive carefully. Cars were being pulled out of ditches and rescued from icy roads. I was trying to switch lanes and just lost the front, front end of my car. Lost the steering. As winds picked up, snow swirled over the top of the roads, making it for icy driving and tough to see. It was not a great Sunday drive for these people trying to get around near West Burnside this morning. 
Without any traction devices, the car tried to get up the hill, but kept sliding down. Clark County got off to an unusually quiet start. The icy Sunday morning kept many indoors. This is what it was like walking earlier today. Most people decided it wasn't worth driving on the icy streets. They stayed at home. And those who tried to get around by walking also found out it was a slippery one. So I was coming this way, he was coming this way. I, I see him, you know, he, you can see his tracks right here almost. Five people were involved, two of them critically injured. You can see the ice made it even more difficult for emergency service crews to get this gurney into the ambulance. The foul weather was foul for one of our fine feathered friends. It just wasn't ducky for this duck that kept slipping and sliding on the ice. After the freeze comes the thaw. And already there are signs of high water. All right, here we had uh, water going across both lanes, and I just unplugged the catch basin. You seen a lot of that? Yeah, we're going to get more before the day's over. And before the week is over, the flooding may be on local rivers instead of local roads. We expect three to six inches of rain over the next few days. That, along with snow melt, may be too much for some streams. The rivers that, that drain from the coast range, the north coast basins and central coast basins, and then also some of the ones that are draining from the Cascades. Um, we could be seeing something in the Clackamas and Sandy. Frozen yesterday, today the Sandy River flows. Below Bankful, for now. Oh, I've never seen it like this before. Uh, this is the first time I see it, even with any ice on it. It was flooded here a while back, but the last time we had that storm, it was clear up here, clear up here to the, t to the top. Over on the Columbia, the ice flows are fading and the river still has plenty of room for meltwater. The Willamette is warmer, no slush to be seen. So even with the heavy warm rain and the melting snow, these giants are not likely to flood. But the rivers and streams that feed them have a much smaller tolerance for winter's next onslaught. They've been at this three days in Union, ever since Mother Nature took a detour down 10th Street. Just with the river flow coming up, it was backing up to the house, and hopefully this will keep it out of the garage. As you can see right on the house, we're within about two inches of, of whatever's going to happen there. Carol e. Dixon usually watches traffic roll down her quiet avenue, but today it's a river flooding her yard. I just never expected it to get this far. I thought we'd be able to divert it. And it's diverting, but it's getting deeper. And like six of her neighbors, three feet deep in the house. Five days of 20 below temperatures turned Catherine Creek into an Arctic ice flow, 10 feet thick. But underneath, a powerful stream had to go somewhere. Here it's being diverted to save more homes. Normally, this irrigation ditch would just be knee deep. But since the creek is completely frozen over, all the water is being diverted down this way. As a result, it's flooding the homes. But in its own way, it's also bringing the community together. Everyone pitches in with sandbags to stop the flooding, measuring their success by inches and thankful for good neighbors. Everybody pitched in. People that don't even live in this area, completely from the other side of town, came out to help us. And we appreciate and we'd do the same for them. No one can ever remember anything like this, but then it only happens once every 500 years. The big thaw is making a big splash. A stream that empties into Rock Creek swamps West Union Road near 185th. Motorists simply muscle their way through the water, spilling over the road because of heavy rain and clogged drainage pipes. Even veteran road crews are impressed with the icy thaw. It's pretty neat. <laughs> Uh, probably the aftermath ain't going to be so great. <laughs> Could this trickle eventually turn into a torrent? Experts at the National Weather Service say there is a possibility the warm, heavy rains could eventually spark widespread flooding. People making the morning commute were caught unaware that Thano Creek had come up so much. You could see drivers making the decision whether to forge ahead and drive through the high water or turn around and try a different way. Floodwaters are causing major headaches for people living in a west side apartment complex. 30 units in the Cedar Mill Crossing apartments flooded this morning. The water continues to rise. Cedar Mill Creek is normally only a few inches deep. Today it has risen to more than eight feet. It looks like this is the first wave of a series of storms headed our way. Natalie Daly thought it was a nightmare. 
but she wasn't dreaming. Police were outside her home at three in the morning in a rowboat. They had a boat. They had a boat, a raft in my driveway. It was outrageous. <laughs> it's raining like it's gonna be the last flood of the century. <laughs> we climbed into the boat and they rowed us out of our driveway. It was absolutely astonishing. She is one of 120 people evacuated in the darkness of morning. By daylight, much of the water had receded, but the steady rains had wetlands and farms looking like huge lakes. This is Seehofer Flats, and when it floods, you can see why they call it that. But even as the water lapped up around her farmhouse, Mrs. Seehofer wasn't worried. Oh, I don't think it will. Never did before. And if it does, well, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Officials have yet to determine the scope of the damage. I think this is one of the fastest floods we've had in a long time. It literally came up overnight. While more rain is predicted, many residents who were yanked from their homes are praying that it won't fall as fast so that they can clean up and dry out without ever having to go through this again. It's not just the wet carpeting and wet flooring, it's the things you left behind. You can't take the dog and the cat with you, you know? So it's a very scary night. The flood water came from up the street where driving was tough. A car left high and dry from raging floodwaters pouring down the hillside. My neighbor's in bad shape. Uh, every time it does overflow, it goes down into his property and it looks like uh, he's getting it worse than normal. The power of the gushing Malala takes down tall, healthy trees. There is. Washing them far downstream. The way we describe the Malala is it comes up fast and it goes down fast. Joan Nason has lived along the Malala for 25 years. You can watch as the river starts soaking her backyard and heads towards her home. Take a look at these pictures of the river. It's at Mill Dam near Estacada. Look at this. The Clackamas River running near its highest level in 10 years, spewing water over the spillway of the dam. The River Mill Dam generates power for PGE. What a difference a day makes yesterday. Mm -hmm. It was the ice we were worried about waking up. Some of my neighbors saw them slip and get in that morning Gee, was, paper. Was that only yesterday? Yeah. Yeah, what a difference <laughs> it makes. Let's go to Curran Snipes again. Curran, you probably remember the difference between yesterday and today, right? You remember? stay right there, Curran. We're going to compare. This is Curran yesterday. <laughs> and look at that, Curran, your slip sliding away there. Tonight, you're wet. <laughs> yesterday, you were sore. <laughs> you took your little uh, fall there. What do you prefer, Curran? Uh, I think I'll take uh, this nice wet weather any day. No doubt about it, homeowners are taking a beating this winter. First it was wind, whipping trees on top homes. Then a deep freeze paralyzed people's plumbing from within. Now it's floods lapping at the front door. Tom Jaffe doesn't live anywhere near a stream, but the ground is so saturated it's even backed up his French drain. It's not uh, handling it, it's overflowing and going down into the basement. He had this sump pump on most of the night. That kept his basement from flooding. Marie Matzies thought she had a famous river flowing into her basement. So much water, it flooded over the top here, and then came down over the sides like, like Niagara Falls. There's a walk under here someplace. Matzie says she's found cleanup after the flood can be the toughest, especially since last week's big chill left her without water. Now she's left with a big mess. We expected some high water with all the rain and the snow melt, but no one could have predicted this type of flooding. High water is rushing across several roads and through dozens of communities, soaking everything in the way. And this may be only the beginning, because we could get another half a foot of rain in the next few days. Above Highway 30, the hills are alive with waterfalls. The highway has been closed for most of the day. The road is covered by water or mud. Businesses are little islands. There's too much water. It has to go somewhere. Roads look like rivers of thick mud. The St. John's Bridge is closed. You can't get to it anyway. Elsewhere, a very muddy Johnson Creek is spilling its banks. How about Mount Scott Creek? Yes, that's supposed to be a creek drowning the parking lot. You can see the Clackamas River is also a threat while the Tualatin River has turned farmland into a floodplain. Take a look at how neighborhoods are waterlogged from Dawson Creek. 
Look at the home in the center under construction. That's really waterfront property with the waters lapping at the door. Even the multi-million dollar Nike campus is surrounded by dirty water. Never seen anything like it. Water from here, clear to there. In Marion County, water over the road isn't the only problem. Part of Highway 22 is starting to fall apart. But when the sign says, be prepared to stop, Lisa Patterson and Jim Lind had no idea what they were in for. We came around the corner and uh, there was this huge, huge canyon hole. Uh, I mean, you could fit, you know, a Mack truck in there and it'd get lost. Just we, off Highway 22, amazed, uh, a 70-foot section turned, of Little North Fork Road gone. is we missing. They were the first to notify uh, authorities. I thought, oh my God, seconds before this, I mean, had we been hurrying up a little bit, you know, quicker to get home, we could have been driving over this when it fell in the river even. Hey. Marion County Public Works crews were also stunned by this enormous hole in the road. I've never seen one of our roads do this. This is, it's, it's a big hole. So Jim and Lisa won't make it home tonight. They don't know when they'll make it back home. They've already tried two alternate routes, no luck. Even going home and taking everything for granted, you can't do that. You know, you come upon something where you could, you might not be here right now. One minute this was a passable highway, you know, and the next second it's just a huge hole and it's impassable and it just, boom, it happens, you know, and it's, it's just incredible, the power of the earth. As night falls, the waters keep rising. Several creeks and rivers in our area have flooded or threatened to flood. Even areas that aren't traditional flood spots are washed out. Residents are turning to sandbags in an effort to protect their property. But will it be enough? Now take a look at this. The, you can tell how high the water is behind me, but I'm going to use the spotlight to point out what's happening just on the bridge, just below where we are. You can see the creek now is barely making it underneath that bridge. And over here, we can see just how close Salmon Creek is to take it out to Robinson's house. This is Salmon Creek right here. They've been all day long putting sandbags along here. And right down along the line here, you see it's been holding a little bit. But this gets, look at there, it's just now starting to come up over it. That's how the waters have been rising. And these sandbags that they've had all day thinking that it's holding back, they don't, not sure at all it's going to work, but they are going to bring in some more through the night, and everybody's just keeping their fingers crossed that sandbagging and a little bit of help from Mother Nature, that these waters will start receding instead of continuing to rise. Let's go to Mark House, who's on the Sandy River. Mark, bring us up to date on what's happening there. Well, Julie, the Sandy River is now, according to Troutdale Police, at its highest level since 1964. And old timers around here know very well what that Christmas flood in Portland was all about uh, 26 years ago, back in 1964. It is a black and white version of today's flood damage. December 1964, Portland Harbor reached 30 feet higher in surrounding areas. Well, how high was the water here, Bill? Uh, it was uh, 32 and a half inches as near as I can find out, according to watermark on my uh, lace curtain on the front door and uh, inside on the wall. Thousands of Oregonians were evacuated. The state was declared a disaster area, but even the experts could not foresee it would happen again so soon. Actually, this flood would, occurred, would occur about once every 200 years. I would say that perhaps uh, happen, about, happen about as often as your next door neighbor's wife having triplets uh, twice in a row. Now, 32 years later, rivers are raging, dams are stressed, and people's homes and businesses are in jeopardy. The other great floods. In 1894, Portland Harbor reached 28.7 feet. People made their way through Portland's downtown in rowboats, and the fire department used a barge to make its way through town. In 1923, another big hit when Portland Harbor reached 25.3 feet a similar flood in 1948. But most living Oregonians remember 1964 as the big one, the real disaster. Was everything ruined? Did you save something? Well, I saved but very little, tell the truth. Uh, uh, I didn't expect anything like this. 
and some worry December 1964 will be copied in February of 96. In Portland, Sheila Hamilton, Channel 2 News. Sheila, what can you tell us uh, relative to the insurance picture? Well, what we found out, Paul, is pretty disturbing. The Federal Emergency Management Agency tells us that fewer than 20% of the Oregonians who live in floodplains own flood insurance. But some of these homes here, right on the river, have the water all the way underneath them. Fortunately, the uh, mobile home itself is a couple feet off the ground, but uh, residents are definitely anxious about high, how high this water has come so quickly, and authorities are actually considering evacuating some of these folks if the water gets much higher. As you can see, a number of tugs are holding back the, uh, the rafts right now. They actually have people, gentlemen, out there on the rafts hooking them together so they can get a better handle on what's going on here so they can organize these rafts into uh, better consolidation. But from right now, on the Willamette River at the Newport Bay restaurant, the logs are here. It was just a little bump, a little kiss, but they found out that it could have taken the whole restaurant had the logs not hit the Markham Bridge first. Are you a Portland resident? Yes, I am. Have you seen the river like this before? Never. Never seen it like this. This is, uh, this is treacherous. I can't believe it. What happened? <laughs> Mother Nature's getting us back for all the things we've done wrong or something. I don't understand. It's risky business for Jerry Graber, giving the heave-ho to floating debris. Debris that threatens houseboats on Savi Island. If that stuff gets under the uh, walkways, it could cause some serious damage. Yes, it could. It could tear our stringers loose. Graber says floodwaters already raised the channel so much, this piling, which usually towers over his house, is now five feet below the roof line. And more flooding is expected to rise above the roof lines of these cars in the parking lot. In fact, it could breach low points on the Savi Island levee. Curran Snipes is standing by with some amazing pictures of what this water has done. Curran? Uh, hi, Julie. We are in Sandy, so we could bring you these pictures, but we were in Welch's earlier this morning, and uh, quite, a, quite a sight it was indeed. Uh, hard to imagine, in fact, what we saw. A retired couple awoke this morning to the sound of their home sliding off a hillside. That wall that's, that's sticking out that way used to face this way. Neighbors can't believe what happened to Curtis and Margaret Wilder's home. The retired couple was asleep upstairs in their log cabin when they felt a rumble. I said, um, this is the big one's earthquake, and then the house tilted up. It wasn't an earthquake, but a mudslide that slammed into the cabin, knocking it off the foundation. Not only did the mudslide take out the house, but also a stretch of road behind it. You can see the asphalt up there, and then you can see where the road used to be. Residents say if this had happened a half hour later, there would have been a school bus coming along. Now the pavement simply disappears where a huge gash mars the landscape. This is where much of it wound up, Skosh People's House. He says a neighbor telephoned in the middle of the night to say, watch out. The torrent of water not only hit the front of the house, but went under the house and then came through the house, blowing out the back door. Look, you can see thousands of gallons of water just pouring through the house. Meanwhile, Curtis Wilder talked to his insurance agent, but the future wasn't really on his mind. What do you do now? <sighs> We're lucky to be alive. We're thankful to be alive. Good evening, everybody, on a day we will never forget. We are not out of this yet. It's bad right now. All the creeks are over their, all, over their banks. They're all flooding that we've seen, and it's, there's still more to come. There's a lot of snow out here yet to be melted. In fact, just a few days ago, roads like this one near downtown Hood River were slick and icy, very, very dangerous. Now the temperature is rising fast. The trouble is there's still a lot of snow like this all across Hood River County, and this stuff is melting very, very fast. The melting snow surrounds another home near downtown Hood River and floods Matthew Smith's basement. The water is extremely cold. So cold, you can even see ice floating in the mess, a mess created when water rushed through Smith's neighborhood. And the water just rushes in through the windows, knocked a couple of the glass panes out. Around the corner, more misery. Workers at the Swell City Carpet Center try to save what they can. 
all these rolls of vinyl and along here and all the VCT, what happens is even though you only see the water up to here, it's actually soaking up a lot higher. Water covers the warehouse floor, damaging everything it touches. I'm kind of kicking myself because it, we could have prepared by getting everything off the floor but had no idea it was going to be this bad. Uh, we are asking people to stay indoors, uh, not travel if they don't have to, to stay off the telephone so emergency people can uh, communicate with each other. It's been a soggy day over on the Oregon coast and frankly there's just no easy way into Tillamook County tonight. Let's go to the video and I'll show you. There are so many reasons. Here is a huge one. This is Highway 22. A huge cave-in extending about 50 feet back underneath the pavement gave way and basically forced all motorists to turn around and head back towards Highway 18. This was near Hebo. Here is the big reason most people cannot get into Tillamook tonight, a flood ex basically surrounding the community, stranding uh, vehicles, strand stranding their uh, drivers, and surrounding the entire town, making it virtually impossible to get in or out of Tillamook tonight. They say it's the worst in 40 to 50 years, the local residents. Floodwaters from snowmelt, buckets of rain, and high tides caught everyone by surprise. Motorists left their cars in the middle of what was once Highway 101. Scores of them, in fact, some with their windows down. Now quiet testimony of how fast the floods hit. Never been this bad. As far as I've, as long as I've been here and as long as I've been, as much as I've been told, that it's never been this deep. I've never seen it this high up to the road. The livestock were not spared either. The impact on local farms can only be guessed at, but it will be devastating. Go, 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 go. Late today, a state of emergency was declared by Governor Kitzhaber, as many farmers, helped by friends and neighbors, rushed to get their dairy herds to higher ground. And with a much soggier day to come, Tillamook County can only prepare for more flooding to come. In southwest Washington, this is the scene in La Center. A section of Timmins Road gave way late last night, slid down a hillside. One man escaped injury just before the road crumbled. Barbara Wood uh, has been in Benjamin across from Hood River, where the situation is also very serious. It all started when the thaw began on Snowden Mountain. Now, Walnut Street in Benjamin looks a lot more like Walnut Rapids. I can't believe the force of the water. It's just a small creek that runs, and this is this road isn't usually flooded. This is the first time it's been flooded. Dry Creek really got going around 6 this morning. By 9 o'clock, the townsfolk knew they were in trouble. Well, this is normally just a little, uh, little runoff ditch. Rock-filled, muddy water flowed steadily as people worked quickly to get sandbags in place. Looks like the homes over here are going to be okay. They got the sandbags up in enough time, but not in time enough for the folks down the street at the Elk Lawn. They just took on two feet of water. Karen Jorgensen's the president of the Women's Auxiliary. She can hardly believe her eyes. Everything is ruined. It'll be months if, if we ever get open again. Now take a look at this. This is the Clackamas River near Estacada. This is the second highest flow through the River Mill Dam in history. The second highest flow. We found Brian Butler wading through two and a half feet of raw sewage and water. This muddy maze used to be his basement, but he's not leaving his home along Mill Creek. We got flooded from the opposite of the creek side of our house, so uh, really was something that we weren't prepared for. Butler's gambling he'll be safe, but many others who made the decision to stay put are now trapped by the river running wild. Anxious residents of this mobile home park in Carver could do little but watch the rising tide. Upstream along Tranquility Road, it was anything but tranquil as Clackamas County Sheriff deputies used boats to rescue stranded homeowners. Yeah, we don't really twist their arms. It's their decision. We encourage them to, to come out, and we're going to facilitate that as best we can. But some people are bound and determined to stay, and so we're going to let them. This man's daughter was one of those trapped by the floodwaters. He's worried. She's balling. Uh, I'm worried to get her out. And look at it. Far, it goes clear to the river, which is a quarter mile that way. The waters of the Sandy M haven't been this high for more than 30 years. 
Now I guess it's going to get worse. Fear the waters will rise even higher has rescue crews asking people along the Sandy Am's edge to leave voluntarily. I was going to stay home. And then I um, looked out the window and jumped a foot. I couldn't believe it went so fast. Not like being on television. Raging waters surrounded several homes in a secluded wooded area. A Coast Guard helicopter came to the rescue, but found the trees made it difficult to get eight people out. Taking two at a time and landing in the middle of Highway 22, they got the job done. Well, it was pretty wild. It, uh, they did a good job, though, and uh, I just hope the animals are okay. Uh, That'd be scary, though. Yeah, it was real scary. I guess the horses can swim, though. <laughs> but chickens can't, and neither can pigs. Now that two dozen people evacuated from this area are safe, they're now concerned about their livestock and property. You're looking at a live picture, and look at the Willamette right now. It's sitting at a little over 20 feet right now. They expect that to go even higher, and there is a chance by tomorrow that the river could rise above the seawall and start to flood out some of the areas in downtown Portland. A dire prediction for downtown Portland tomorrow as the Willamette River continues to rise. Flood stage is 18 feet. Right now, it's nearly 21 feet. But listen to what Portland Mayor Vera Katz is saying tonight. We have uh, new information that tomorrow by 7 p.m., we expect uh, the water to rise to 28.8 feet over the, uh, by the wall. That probably will be over the wall by then. So it's... Uh, it's a couple of hours sooner than we anticipated. And so all the work that is being planned tonight will start tomorrow and we'll just get it done uh, by the time that reaches that height. City employees have worked into the night to develop the plan to save downtown Portland from flooding. Sandbags ring the Northwest Natural Gas Building. Among the businesses on that bottom floor, a bank, a restaurant, and the offices for the Portland Rose Festival Association. Sandbagging will continue in downtown through the night and into tomorrow. Sandbags are going down in hopes of cutting off the rising waters of Mill Creek. The stream is over its banks, flooding streets and now threatening homes. Even though the water is already surrounding some houses, people remain optimistic sandbags will do the job. Yeah, hope so. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying. That's about all we can do, I guess. It's tough enough getting around Salem with storm drains backing water onto streets so they have to be closed. But now there's even a bigger problem. Mill Creek here is now spilling over the bridges that it once flowed under. That's causing backups all around town and major headaches for people just trying to move around Salem. High clearance four-wheel drive trucks are about the only motorized vehicles making it down Ferry Street. Bikes work up to chain level. On foot works about the best, but you're going to get wet. Where's the wood, Jeff? Where's the wood? This man and his son were picking up logs floating all over the streets. He says he's preparing for the next round of wicked weather. If we get hit with another cold snap, I'm going to need this wood. If we don't, I've got enough to make the winter. So this is like a gold mine for you. I love it. Yeah, and I'm cleaning the street at the same time. And giving Jeffrey a ride. He's three. He <laughs> loves it. Floodwaters from Johnson Creek turned Foster Road into a lake. Many homes and cars in a 20 square block area are already flooded out. Despite the mayor's suggestion for voluntary evacuations, some longtime residents are staying put. The water's already at Ron Springer's doorstep, but he still won't go. Taking the horses out, don't want them in the flood water. These people evacuated horses to higher ground. One boy picks up a mailbox washed away by the high water. Even the driver who gave us a ride through the flood says it's time to go. Uh, I think they should have taken it seriously about two or three hours ago. Seriously. It's a little late now. Uh, right now, joining me is Commissioner Earl Blumenauer, who's been out this morning, I guess, assessing the situation. Tell me what you're doing with the city right now. Well, uh, our crews have been working, as you know, uh, re having an opportunity here to uh, have a, a barrier here by the seawall. Uh, things are proceeding a little slower than we'd like because there have been some problems uh, getting materials here on sites because of other road problems. But we really want to emphasize that this is not a place for people to come down and sightsee. There's important work that needs to be done here, and if people want to help, they can clear catch dirt basins in their neighborhoods. They can look out after people. They can call the volunteer line, and we want people to be prudent, uh, be careful, stay away from the work area. 
uh, and think a little bit. It's, this is a morning that it might be wise to take an extra hour or two, listen to the news, get the information, uh, if at all possible. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Earl Blumenauer. Appreciate you uh, spending a few minutes with us. I want to show you what the gauge does look like right now. And you can see it, it goes up to 31 feet, and it's now at about 23 and a half feet. It has come up uh, about a foot in the, uh, the past hour or so. And folks that have uh, been coming by just say this is incredible to see. They've just never seen anything like this. It was still dark this morning at the waterfront park seawall, but volunteers were there doing their part. <laughs> Right alongside City of Portland maintenance crews were everyday folks filling sandbags and forming a human chain to throw the bags onto trucks. What makes these folks drop everything at home and pick up shovels at the seawall? Some say they answered a public plea for help. I saw the news this morning and they had pleaded for some help from like uh, carpenters to help reinforce the wall. and. I don't know anything about carpentry, but I know how to handle a shovel. Dan Kahn is a law student and part-time carpenter who decided to offer up his skills free of charge. I've been wiring up the plywood to the rails and then filling up sandbags and tossing gravel around and, you know, basically having a great time. And volunteers were rewarded with camaraderie and a good hot meal offered by several local restaurants. It is pretty amazing. A lot of people down here and everybody's friendly and doing their job and however they can help that's that's the mission right now the volunteer everyone pointed to today was Linda Swearingen she and her friend were trying to get back to Redmond when they gave up and joined the party under the Morrison Bridge we've called all morning trying to head home and we can't so we decided to come down to the waterfront and just volunteer and help people out and it's neat to see how Oregonians pull together Right here we've got a, just a few remnants of some sand. This is where the, uh, the volunteers all scramble to put together the sandbags. But it looks like they've got everything uh, under control here right now. It looks like that they've got the, the, the barricades up and that right now it's just a matter of standing by waiting to see what happens. But I do want to show you that gauge because uh, we've been following that all day long and you can see there that it's, uh, it's over 25 feet now. It's uh, swirling just a little bit, uh, but it's over 25 feet and the water continues to rise. Bless your heart. It's <laughs> like love to volunteer. You guys do a good job. Well, uh, what can I do? they mean... Thank you again. Okay. There's quite a bit of stuff to do, and we'll be busy for some time here, but the biggest body of it, the most important part, is, is done. We have some shoring up to do, uh, bolting and stuff to do down there. We have uh, some Jersey barricades to place some more sandbags, and I think we're going to put some gravel in some of these places like we have here. Gary, if the river goes over the seawall, what happens now that this stuff is pretty well in place? Well, we hope we uh, get to get the stand, stand back and watch it slide on by. Basically, the barricade is to slow the water from coming over. It isn't going to stop every drop, but it's going to let more water go by than comes in. Are you surprised that this went up so fast? Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, what I'm also You mean the, the work or the water? The work. I'll tell you, I, four hours ago, I never would have bet on it. We had a lot of volunteers. We've had more city involvement, too, and the volunteers, I think, is what really put it over the top. The volunteers have done a stupendous job in getting all of this pretty well shored up. We've got plywood for most of the two miles along Waterfront Park, plywood and 30,000 bags of sand. Right here through the Willamette Falls area, and you can see behind me just how dramatic the picture really is. The falls have pretty much disappeared in this sweeping current that we have right now. I just talked to somebody who told me that there's normally a 25, 30 foot drop in the falls there. That has pretty much filled up, which gives you an indication that's about how high the water is. By 6.30 a.m., the Columbia River reached 23 feet. Flood stage for this area on Columbia Way is 20 feet. Just the awesomeness of, of the power of this river. Seeing the river this high under the I-5 bridge is an eerie sight. Many residences and businesses all along the river did what they could to protect the buildings. Many have evacuated, and Vancouver isn't the only area in trouble. I was here in 64, and there was a lot of water, but I don't remember it quite that high. I live in Woodland, and we moved our trailer out at 2 o'clock this morning, and our, our park is underwater. 
In Washington state alone, six counties have declared a state of emergency, and of course this is one of them. What a mess we have all throughout the region. We're going to switch to OMSI right on the Willamette River on the east side here where our reporter Jeremy Diesel is standing by. What's the latest, Jeremy? Well, things are looking much better here at OMSI, and it's all because of these monstrous lifelines. They've now attached pumps to the basement that's been flooding for three days. The crisis hour hit at three, between 18 and 20 feet of water flooding the basement area of the museum. It's coming in from all sides. It's not just the riverside. Um, we've got uh, open uh, electrical conduits from the old building that were there. We've got cracks in the ground, uh, cracks in the cement. Several heavy-duty pumps weren't enough to keep up with the rising water. A basement-level main electrical power box was in danger. Water coming within one inch. The catch, turning off the power, would have turned off the pumps. The savior of OMSI in this flood may turn out to be these generator pumps. They're pumping thousands and thousands of gallons of water a minute out of the basement of OMSI. You can see the outflow tanks. What's coming out of here are 9,800 gallons of water. That translates to 240 bathtubs worth per minute. We want to go to Salem now and show you the scene earlier today to give you some sense of the human loss, the human drama, and the emotion that comes attached with a day like this. Uh, we've lived here for, oh, about 25 years, I guess. I can't just walk off and leave that. It's our home. Bob Hadley has lived along Mill Creek through the 1964 flood, but this time the water is coming from the front and the back. Much worse than the 64 flood. Mm -hmm. Much worse. Uh, I, I don't. And, and if this was the end of it, I would say they're comparable, but it isn't the end of it. There's the water that's underneath the house. About 40 students from Oregon City High School lined up to help out the Emporium Department Store after the store's basement began to flood. They volunteered. They called us last night and said, you need help, and we said yes. <laughs> we have the first pictures from that area, close-up pictures of what exactly happened to that building. Here's a look at the devastation. What you're looking at, just so you understand the power of what happened here, you're looking at a two-story building that had a parking complex underneath it. So not only did that uh, building get knocked off its foundation, but then the first floor parking area was also collapsed onto it. Incredible pictures from today. Here, Take a look right at this. There. Wow. Good thing you... Uh... Wow, look at it. It's coming down the hill here. Look at my Come on, Whoa! I knew I should have gotten out of here. Something was telling me. Oh, God. Whoa! Stop. Wow. Oh my God! Is your heart working again? People in here can get out, and I don't know what we're gonna do about that car. I have no authority. They just picked to... it up like there was nothing. Oh yeah. Just picked it up like nothing. Yeah. Set it on top of that other car. The Interstate 84, not just one, but a number of mudslides. This is in the Troutdale area. Now look at this is I-84. See the truck just stranded there in the middle. Can you imagine a horrible situation? This is going to take literally days. I-84 closed to the gorge for at least four days at last word. Well, look at this. Uh, I would consider that an active slide. Uh, stuff still coming down. This is going to be some time in the cleanup. We are almost uh, sealed off in, in all directions in this town, given high water in every direction. And we've just been talking about the major roads. There are hundreds of little highways and little streets that are completely blocked off. We can't even mention them all. We're just covering the major ones right now. The good news, if you missed it earlier, uh, Matt Safino, who's as good at watching the river as he is at uh, watching the skies, told us uh, some hours ago that tomorrow's crest 
which is still expected to take place sometime around 10 a.m., will not be the anticipated 30 feet. It will crest out at approximately 29 feet, which is uh, about eight-tenths of an inch by our reckoning under the levels that we struck during the floods of 1964. The Spencers return home to their flooded mobile home park for the first time since the Klatskanai River ran through it. Inside, Candy Spencer checks on the two cats she had to leave behind. Oh, come here, baby. Oh, there she goes. Oh, baby. Oh, no. The cats are okay, but their home is a muddy mess. All across Klatskanai, people are cleaning up. Vernonia woke up Thursday morning to a nightmare. The Halem River and Rock Creek flooded out the northeast Oregon timber town. Rowboats, the only way to get around. Access roads were washed out, cutting off the flow of supplies, food, utility workers, and a way out of town. The worst thing was that it happened so fast here in Vernonia. In just a matter of hours, the Halem River flooded the entire city. No one had time to prepare. What was under four feet of water yesterday is now under a layer of mud. Here's a look at the disaster one Oak Grove family discovered today when they returned to their flooded home. Flood my house, well, there's still mud in my house from the 64 flood, so this house has now lived through two major floods. If, if this one's salvageable, I don't know. Oh, it was, was uh, getting to be a real nice home. We've been working on it for about four years, or five, yeah, four or five years now. And uh, had all brand new floors throughout and drywall. We about were here at 1 o'clock o'clock in the morning. It was like to our ankles. And this is the first time we've been in the house since 1 o'clock this morning. <laughs> a good chance. A lot of us are, don't know what we're doing. I'm looking at my house going, I don't have any idea where I'm going, what I'm doing next. 18 square blocks of downtown Tualatin are under as much as two feet of water. People used boats to get around the flooded streets today. Residents placed sandbags to prevent more businesses from being flooded. Now we want to take you to Lake Oswego, where rising waters threaten that city tonight. Oswego Lake is overflowing its banks into the city, already flooding some businesses and homes. City crews had to poke holes into a dam to relieve the pressure. Now, earlier tonight, Channel 2's Ken Cole visited that area. It's spilling right over the top of the spillway here, just about six inches from the top of the dam. A tremendous amount of water flowing through here right now as they try to relieve some of the pressure. There were a lot of folks that were fighting desperately with rising floodwaters, trying to save their homes, filling sandbags. But again, the Tualatin has just been a, re a relentless uh, river. Also, uh, the Willamette River is causing the same problems here in Lake Oswego. Pictures taken from the air today show just how close downtown Portland came to uh, flooding. You can see this industrial area just south of the River Place Marina, covered with water. Let's move on to downtown Portland, the tense flood situation at the River Place Marina, easing somewhat tonight. The water did manage to make its way into the River Place Promenade. There's the Harborside Restaurant there and other businesses. However, a row of sandbags protected the businesses from any major flooding up in the air. You can get a better view. Images and pictures that will stay with us forever. The flooding caught the attention of the White House. President Clinton came to Portland to survey the damage on Valentine's Day. He found people coming together, neighbor helping neighbor, in a time of need. President Clinton views the damage from above. A helicopter ride down the swollen Columbia River into Cowlitz County. On the ground, he walks through a woodland neighborhood badly damaged by the flood. God bless you, Jeff, and with us for the you. next time, anyway. Thank you. <laughs> President Clinton visits the home of Doug and Delois Jungnickel. This is what he sees inside. Three feet of water in the family room, a badly damaged floor, and personal possessions left out to dry. It's a bad flood. These people have lost a lot, but... You know, that we'll just all have to work together to help them put their lives back together. I hope everybody in all the little towns in the United States see this and maybe it gives them hope for the government helping them if anything ever happens. You know, it gives them a better feeling, really. The president delivers his message of hope to about 300 people on Rhododendron Street. Most are flood victims. We will do what we can to help you put it back together and get going in the right direction just as quickly as we can. 
Next stop, City Hall, where the president praises the cleanup effort by volunteers in a small town like many others, hit hard by the flood of 96. Just don't forget, for folks, this, this country is made up of woodlands. After landing on the Portland waterfront, the president walked along the two-mile barricade built by volunteers, the same barricade that many had said could not be built. And in an interview, he said the wall will serve as a symbol of what happens when people pull together. What, what did you think about the seawall? The one that was built by the volunteers. I thought it was, first of all, it was an awesome accomplishment, just the idea that it was done in a day. But I think it really symbolizes what's best about this country. You know, we, everybody uh, rallied to the mayor's call. You may not believe this, but this, this wall has really captured the imagination of people all over the country, everybody that's heard about it. The president shook hands with about 300 people, many of them the volunteers who had helped build the wall. Our country has been watching you and pulling for you and praying for you. The going will get tough again for these people in a week or two weeks or three weeks. Many of them are almost in shock now, but they will have to come to grips with the dimensions of their losses. And so I ask you all, be on the lookout for your friends and neighbors for the next few weeks, because a lot of them will have to come to grips with enormous personal loss and anxiety and pain. And they will need you then as well. Thank you. God bless you. When this thing starts to calm down, we're all going to have to pitch together. And, and help our uh, fellow people who were in trouble, neighbor helping neighbor. It'll take days, perhaps weeks, to hose down and scrape off tons of mud. That was the worst experience I've ever had in my life. I've never seen anything like this. It really was. Dan Landholt calls it a miracle. They stood in here for three days in that water and they survived. When you look at the neighboring farms, you understand Dan's feelings for the grisly chore of counting up dead cows in dairy-rich Tillamook County is now underway. Downtown Tualatin is still underwater. 85 businesses are closed. It looked bad enough at dawn, but Department of Transportation engineers didn't know how bad until daylight. And by then, traffic on I-5 was backed up for nine miles. The worst hit, though, these apartments on the banks of the Tualatin River. 97 floor-level units are under six feet of water. The only way into the apartments for flood victims and journalists is by water. You getting your stuff out? Yeah, just a little clothes and stuff. 50,000 cubic yards of mud. The slide hit on Friday night, just as road crews were finishing up cleanup from another slide the day before. They were only minutes away from opening the roadway to traffic. We were cleaning up the road with one last shot of water and kaboom. It, the, whole thing probably five times bigger than the first one came down. More than 200 people have been forced out of their homes, and no one except Mother Nature knows when they can return. It's a world turned upside down for the Gebhardt family. All of this stuff is clothes that were like mud damaged. The Clackamas River raced through her home on Semple Road. It's just devastating. I don't even think it's really even hit me yet, the loss of all of our things, our clothes, our pictures. Everything is just completely ruined in mud. 12-year-old Matt lost almost everything he owns, toys, computer games. If you live by a river, you're going to expect wh whatever comes. It just makes us feel really good that people will come out and help because you can't do it by yourself and you're just so grateful for people that help like this. Those who watched him work this past week would never have guessed he's had a heart bypass that the knees he lifted sandbags with were artificial. Or that he's 83 years old. Jim Reynolds has volunteered nearly every day since last Thursday, the day he saw the flood victims on TV. I really appreciate you working. You think I got a whole lot more out of it than you did. Well, I don't know about that. And there's one more thing you might not know about Jim Reynolds, that he's dealing with his own loss right now, one that makes him all the more compassionate for the people around him. It's hard to talk about, but uh, we had a head-on collision the 6th of December, and I lost my wife and her, her best friend. Jim Reynolds' way of giving thanks for the 60 years he spent with his wife was to give back to other people. The cleanup begins in downtown Tualatin. to get our city back up and running. Volunteers pack up sandbags 
workers pick up lumber. All you can do is pick up and go on. Of course, Oregonians, you know, that's what they're famous for, picking up and going on, <laughs> even when they're down and out. <laughs> now, the lucky ones are moving back in. It'd be expensive property if it was normally that way. Of course, <laughs> it's not. She picked out right about here. John Buchanan and his family went home today. The high waters are gone, but the anxiety and destruction are not. See the bathroom, honey, how terrible it is? Uh-oh. You see the watermark, but just All over right Vernonia, the feeling is the same as hundreds of families try to dry out and clean up. The giant mountain of garbage continues to grow at the end of town, filling up with waterlogged furniture, mattresses, and television sets. Sean Gritman is just five, and she's seen things most adults will never see. The boatway was very scary because um, it was too bumpy in the water. Sean is one of four Gritman children rescued by boat from their flooded Vernonia home. The river jumped the road and swallowed the house in four feet of raging water. We'll be with family for a while, but, you know, I can't last too much longer. I mean, it'll be okay for maybe a month, but if, I'm afraid this is going to last a long time. The kids are sleeping at relatives, but this temporary shelter is a comforting place for a bite to eat and some loving attention. What is making things more difficult in Vernonia is that the two major highways are casualties of the heavy rains. Highway 47 has been partially washed out, and the Scafoos Vernonia Highway is blocked after giving way to the water-soaked hillside. For the last four days, Vernonia was an island, an island underwater. The Gritman's home will likely be condemned. Its front porch is ready to give way. Its back porch has disappeared in the water. The children understand the loss. I don't want the house to fall down a lot and our, all my stuff will be broken. Sean's stuffed animals are the only treasures that made it out. All of the children's toys must now be thrown out after being contaminated by floodwaters. I miss my, my pig and I miss my my babies. You can see the strain in the face of the young mother of four, a mother who doesn't have a drop of flood insurance. But the toll on the children is also great. Children who lost part of their innocence in the angry waters of the Nehalem. The Columbia River was a lot rougher last Wednesday night when Don Boswell saw something in the darkness coming down the mouth of the someone. Sandy River. Never have ever seen anything like that happen. What he saw was 70-year-old Harold Jank standing on this, all that was left of his home, a home that became a life raft when a landslide swept it into the rain-swollen Sandy River. It was just before 9 o'clock that night when tons of debris, mud and trees, and you can see just how mucky it still is, came crashing down along this section of Highway 30. It came across the roadway and unfortunately right into the place where Harold and Jackie Jenks' house used to be. But those who helped save her husband don't think they did anything special. We don't really feel like we're heroes. We feel like that uh, somebody was in trouble and we done what we could to help them. They only wish they could have helped Jackie Jank as well. A dangerous rescue captured Thursday on home video as Klatskanai firefighters lead Irene Palamaki from her slide damaged home to safety. To get her there, she had to cross this huge mud and timber slide. Now, four days later, she recalls sitting in her living room with her sister-in-law when the slide started. We're just praying that the house held. But then you never knew when, when these gigantic logs was going to hit um, some big portion and knock the whole thing down on it. As firefighters led Mrs. Palamaki through all this muck and debris, suddenly the earth started moving again. Another landslide heading their direction this one captured on home video. Did you worry about me a little bit? <laughs> the Army National Guard comes to the rescue of local farmers hit hard by the flood. Peter Giordano has more than 600 cattle trapped on Government Island with no food. This is my bedroom. Now I don't know how you clean up a mess like this. Few people need help more than Beulah Hoagland and her husband, Dean Mickles. That was a room for food, canned food. And so on. They can't start cleaning up their devastated home in Dickey Prairie near Malala until they know how much help they'll get from the federal government or whether they'll get any help at all. The river swept away half of Norm Hagstad's home. So there was another 40 feet out from where we stand right now, the bank was. 
And in nearby Malala, the National Guard delivers water to a town where the flood destroyed city water pump. Thank you, my dear, for bringing that. It took 10 hours and three car rides for Rob Redmond to hitchhike here from Idaho. Now he's helping people along Mossy Bray clean up from the flood. He decided to volunteer after seeing pictures of flood-ravaged homes. I figured I'd rather go do that and do something for other people than sit and do nothing. Everybody's really helpful, really getting down here and helping out. It's hard to believe. When other people are hurting and other people can see that and the fact that we can help them, I mean, it's just our obligation. It's what we're supposed to do. It's what being human is about, I think. Rob says he empathizes with the flood victims. He grew up in Southern California where his parents are still recovering from the deadly earthquake that damaged their home a couple of years ago. Rob says he's heard things are also bad in Tillamook and he may go there next, but adds that he's happy to volunteer wherever he's needed. Today, little children play with the rocks in Bingen's Dry Creek. This entrance to the Eagle's Lodge used to be at street level, and this pool table used to be at the other end of the room. About a five to seven hundred pound table. And just the water was coming through so fast, just picked it up and moved it. There's been no damage assessment yet. Right now, all they know is it's pretty high. Also pretty high are the seemingly endless mounds of rocks lining Walnut Street next to the lodge. In fact, I asked. When the guy's out here on the dump truck, I said, did you guys haul that in here, you know, to stop the water? No, nope, it all came off of that mountain. So far, about half of the rock slide's been cleaned up. But until the rest of it goes to the binge and eagles, the rocks are a monument to the water's power. Cleaning up on Beach Street. Jody Lewis sprays off her children's toys. Just a few days after Thomas Creek jumped its banks, and washed across the small Lynn County town of Sayo. The river was actually, it was running through here. Picture living like this. I can't win, I can't get ahead. It's, it, every time I get something done, something else has to be done. Life is trying to get back to normal in Vernonia, but the reality is, even though the floodwaters are gone, the anxiety and depression are not. Like this, you know, you, you're up here and then, um, then you're down, uh, back and forth, but uh, oh, we'll, we'll make it. Tom Flaherty had just remodeled his home when the floods hit. Now he's ripping out insulation and waterlogged carpet. It will be a while for classes to resume at Vernonia High School, too. Ryan Ragsdale says missing school like this is no fun. Everybody's textbooks, everybody's everything. I mean, the desks had to be taken out, put in here and hosed down. The chairs, the library's just disgusting. But while emotional needs go unmet, Physical needs like food and clothing are pouring in at a rate that is overwhelming the locals. Donations from Fred Meyer, Safeway, and thousands of citizens are flooding relief centers. Hazel and Fred Schaller are finding the pieces of their lives that will help put them back on steady ground. Last week, the raging Lewis River set their belongings afloat in a wash of mud and contaminated water. Look at that. Fred Schaller, who has heart disease and diabetes, was trapped in water above his truck window. Yeah, it makes you wonder whether... Uh, your time has come or not, but uh, no, I, I felt I could make it. Fred walked out of a river rising three feet in less than an hour. These colored pieces of material are pieces of clothing washed away in the water's rage. The shallows Between. still don't know how much they've lost. They're concentrating instead on what they have. I need a mop! <laughs> Good friends, friends who are helping them clean up. Hazel, I never thought I'd have to come down and clean your house like this. How do you thank them? How do you thank these people? It's just, it's not easy. Of course, they know that if the shoe was on the other foot, we'd be there. Just hook onto it and see if we can drag it. Okay, go ahead. At this one household, the river's toll included four cars and four rooms of furniture, but their loss is nothing compared to some. We're alive. <laughs> we could have lost him. And the Schallers find steady ground in strange places. The floodwaters are gone, but a tide of hardship lingers over this part of the Oregon coast. North of Garibaldi, a huge landslide still partially blocks Highway 101. Nearby, another slide cut off the town of Wheeler from its only source of water. They brought what's called a reverse osmosis purification unit, filtering water from a stream near town. The effort brings thanks 
at Wheeler's Treasure Cafe. There was a couple moments of, of sheer panic. We didn't know our, what our fate would be for the next 10 days. So we're, we're very thankful. The patio that once sat here at Oswego Point Bar and Grill was last seen floating down the Willamette. Just kind of broke loose and... Hopefully we're going to find a lot, a lot of people's stuff. That's what we're hoping for. Jack Stiles, a self-styled river rat, is helping people search for stuff that washed away. No easy task considering all the debris. Uh, the stuff that hit bridges and everything come over the falls, we're just finding a lot of pieces. Some things have already been rounded up that survived the wild river ride. So the best I can say is, you know, cross your fingers, um, you know, have patience with us because we're at the mercy of the river gods. It's just like home. I know some people like oatmeal in the morning, some people like eggs. Uh, Leslie so Jensen and her husband are playing innkeeper to neighbors whose homes were ruined by the flood. Uh, this is Bill and Marge's bedroom and uh, their bathroom and Cheryl and Tom are staying in this room. The Jensen's home is on a hill. They invited neighbors to stay when the water began to rise in the nearby Tualatin River. We've watched our poor neighbors deal with uh, a lot, so we feel very fortunate. And they're delightful people. You know, you couldn't ask for better neighbors. Insulation, wallboard. What a mess, huh? Marge Long yeah. and her husband Bill live across the street. Marge says staying with their neighbors makes it a lot easier to get things done. There's something about being close to the familiar, I think. And so we could see our house and it felt better. Yeah. During the height of the flood, Bob Klein slept in his boat outside the Jensen's home, but could use the phone and shower whenever he wanted. It was like a, a hotel in the, uh, in the neighborhood, but you didn't have to pay. Only now is survival near the town of Mist turning to clean up. Um, about up to here. Jeanette Grant shows how high the water got in her home. Here's the window, uh, the mark right there. Jeanette and others are surviving on donated items stored here at the Miss School turned Supply Depot. While most towns and cities are well into their recovery, Mist is hardly even started. Bottled water and barrels of food arrive from flood-stricken Vernonia because the problems in this small town are huge. Luis Valera's barn was flooded and hay that wasn't ruined is running low. He's bought what hay he can. Meanwhile, people in Mist hope the help keeps coming. They'll need it for months. If you want to feel like a flood victim, start from the beginning. Be 20-something. Have a dream of going into business with your best friend from childhood. Find the perfect place, a 5,000-square-foot lakeside property. Spend five months and $225,000 building your business. We had this all planned out over the next two years of how this we were going to grow this, this business, and this wasn't part of it. Close your doors. Steady yourself as you give away $3,000 worth of food. We figured there was going to be some bumps in the road, but we didn't figure there was going to be mountains to climb. <laughs> be 20 something. Watch your first business, your first dream, washed away. Breathe deep and start over. Slabs of asphalt tossed across a field show the flood's power, but it's the bigger picture acres and acres and acres of pasture land smothered in silt that really show the destruction. In places, the mud is several feet thick. Some say it looks like a scene from the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. It will be midsummer before fields can be reseeded and grass grows tall enough to feed dairy cows. A group of uh, farmers in uh, Sisters in Redmond area brought us a load of hay uh -huh. last week uh, for our younger animals. That helped a lot. High-priced hay bales lie steaming and rotting outside his barn, and three and a half miles of fence line disappeared under mammoth logs swept in by the flood. Look at the size of that log. And all up and down here, look, look, look down the river there. My gosh, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's just like a clear cut down through there. But the amount of damage and knowing any day feed donations may stop have even the most optimistic here wondering whether they'll be able to make it through this year. In the small community of River Grove, where nearly half the population has been affected the by the flood, the help is received with open arms. But it's not just the Red Cross that's making a difference here. 
It's also the many volunteers who continue to show up every day. Out of the 125 homes in River Grove, about 25% have been devastated by the flood. Thanks to volunteers, the rebuilding has already started. And as for those who have signed the Crawfords volunteer list... We'll pull it together. <laughs> And then we'll have a bodacious party to thank everyone. <laughs> this gravel road used to lead to almost a dozen homes. Now it's a road to nowhere. Floodwaters swept over the top of this bridge on the Nahalem River just south of Highway 26 three weeks ago. Now its center span lies at the bottom of the river. The only way to get across, small boats and an emergency rope and pulley. I have three kids and, you know, they, they're like they want to go home, but we can't. Waitress Joan Wilcoxon owns one of the homes cut off by the bridge's collapse. She left behind almost everything she owns when she evacuated. Now she fears the bridge may never be rebuilt. I don't know what I'd do. My property value is lower. The bridge may qualify for federal flood disaster relief. Locals hope so because there's no way they can afford the one million dollars it'll take to fix it. And this all was up there, and now it's all down here. It's one of the most scenic trail systems around, offering panoramic views of the Columbia River Gorge and a half dozen major waterfalls. But the trails around Multnomah Falls have taken a real beating in recent weeks. Huge slides have washed out giant sections of the trails, including a newly renovated part of Perdition Trail, where a $150,000 staircase project was wiped out. Neighbors and friends remove furniture and valuables from the home they fear could literally tip over. A mudslide which started two weeks ago has now left the home teetering on disaster. It's heavier on the backside than it is the front. And so if the rest of that leaves, then you've got more weight on the backside and it could just tip over. Utilizing huge cranes, construction crews will work throughout the weekend in an attempt to save the house. Okay, it isn't pretty. 500 pieces of concrete, 45,000 sandbags, 900 cubic yards of rock, and 916 wood panels lining Portland's beloved riverfront. But make no mistake, one week ago, the wall was Portland's last defense against a rising river. And at the time, both, I think, all of us were thinking, we've got to get this thing done or we're in trouble. City workers Steve Barrett and Bill Long scratched out an engineering plan and didn't wait for city approval to buy the supplies. They knew they were in a race against the river. But they wouldn't have won that race without the help of hundreds of volunteers. The emotions I felt when, uh, when the entire city uh, came, out to, uh, came out to help See if I can make it through this. <laughs> it's okay. I don't mind. No, it was, it was uh, spectacular. I, you know, beyond my wildest dream. In the end, it was a mile long, four feet high, a symbol of what can be done when a town pulls together. You're gonna break it, Trent. It sounds like any other school. But there are signs this first day back at school is different. Inside Vernonia's Washington grade school is the high water mark from the flood that tested this building and tested the patience of students shut out of classes for nearly three weeks. Kids are glad to be back. I think it's good. What do you miss most about? Um, probably my friends and stuff. It's good and I talk to them about the flood. Teachers took classes themselves to spot flood-related depression in children. So far, there's been very little. We're totally surrounded. The only access to this school was by boat. Principal Randy Altman carries pictures comparing the damage to cleaned up classrooms. And everyone just pulled together and bit by bit we reclaimed what the flood had taken. But brown bag lunches are still the rule. <laughs> Health inspectors say the cafeteria isn't clean enough to serve hot meals and the freezer room needs work too. You just told me this has to be done. This all has to be done in here. Next door, Vernonia High School's even worse. Classes won't start again for another week in portable classrooms that began arriving today. All part of a recovery that's hardly finished, but not nearly hard enough to break the spirit of those living here.
Channel 2 viewers show they have the spirit of the Northwest by opening their hearts and their checkbooks. They donated half a million dollars to our flood relief effort, money that went directly to people who need it most. Here's a look at how that spirit of giving made a difference. I mean, how many did you lose and how they died? We lost 112 <coughs> and, uh, and they all drowned basically. Some of them when floodwaters forced the nearings to evacuate, they took the herd to the highest ground available. But days later, they found it wasn't high enough. Yeah, we flood here. All the pastures get water every year. It's no big deal. You don't think nothing of it. But nobody would have ever guessed it'd get that deep. Come on, guys. So to help out, we dug into our viewers' flood relief fund to buy 10 Springer heifers. These cows could have cost up to $1,400 apiece. But Nearing's neighbor also wanted to help out, so he cut $550 off the price of each cow. This is our camping area. As you can see, we got food and stuff, shelves around, books to read. The BBs have been living in this small prayer room at the Life Center Open Bible Church ever since the flood forced them from their home. Their woodland trailer home condemned, their belongings inside rotting away. Worked for for years, and now it's in one second it's gone from off money. It's just an awful feeling. It's pretty hard to take. One thing the BBs say they need the most is a bed. When it arrived today, the BBs approved. We've also bought a new refrigerator to help out in the kitchen. That is when they can afford to buy a house that has one. 75 tons of hay rolled into the Nahalem Valley today, compliments of Channel 2 viewers. Farmers anxiously unwrapped it like a Christmas present they never thought they'd get. This hay, trucked all the way from eastern Oregon, is destined for 40 flooded farm families. They came in here with a motorboat and, and rescued us off the top of the stack here. Penda Meeker says the hay the flood destroyed in their barn saved the life of her family. Boss. Now she says this donated hay will save their livelihood by keeping their cattle alive. Well, that the chest of drawers goes in the front bed. Okay. It's only a delivery of donated furniture, but to Arvel and Leola Sessions, it's a truckload of hope. Yes, <laughs> Lived for 85 years, and then you have something like this happen. Like most people in Woodland, the Sessions didn't have flood insurance. The water rose so fast they had only two hours to get out. That meant watching as many of their life's possessions sank. But at 83 and 84, Leola and Arville are starting over with a new bedroom set donated by our viewers. In Mist, it's all hands on deck to recover from the flood. Thank you. What's you doing things? What am I doing things? Yeah. So we can have a house back together. 40 sheets, that'll be 20 of those packs. Your money paid for construction materials to help rebuild nearly 40 homes. While government money is also helping with flood relief, many families say it's too little, too late. They've been too slow, for one, and for another, they don't cover everything that's needed. And this really fills in the gap. Keep going, you'll have it all the way in. And filling in the gaps, one piece at a time, is how the people of Mist are building back their lives. And some of your flood relief money is going back to school. Vernonia High School is still digging out from the flood. Behind me, the new quarters for students to hold classes in while their high school's being remodeled. And once it is, the gym is filled with donated classroom materials by all kinds of people, including our viewers. Things like a new computer card catalog for the library and a new gymnasium floor that is now buckled. It's totally ruined by the flood. You're also helping families like the Wallaces. Donations from Channel 2 viewers will pay for some new furniture. The Wallaces were able to fix up the house themselves, but without your help... We'd have a big empty house. <laughs> That's where we'd be. But, I mean, we're thankful to have the house and, and, you know, the carpet and stuff that we've been able to do on our own. But, but the furniture isn't something that we could afford to replace. Imagine an entire mountainside crashing into your home. Everything inside buried or crushed by boulders. That's what a landslide did to Hirsch and Carol Rosh's life. And I said, oh, we got to get out of here. And he went and looked, and he says, let's get the H out of here. <laughs> and we ran, and I didn't have time to even grab a coat. The solution to their problem? Let's go shopping. Come on. <laughs> Thanks to our viewers, we took the Rosh's to Montgomery Wards, where they could buy some of the items they lost. This one, 
And they bought a TV, a washer dryer, a stove, a water heater, a dishwasher to clean what dishes she could find. Some of it's buried down below the counters and I don't know if they can get them out or not. It sets up like cement. And several other items the Roshes lost in the landslide. Total, more than $10,000. Can't thank people enough. It's just... I haven't got the words to say what, how I feel. Well, you know, thank you is about all I can think of. You know, what else? You know, I, maybe someday I'll get a chance to return it to somebody that needs it. And I will always give. Anytime I have a chance to give and they ask for something, I will give even if it's a little. It's a gift. And thank you very much. I'm just glad that people are thinking about the animals too. You know, the Red Cross is here helping with the people, but a lot of us that have animals, our thoughts were, how are we going to feed our animals? And the viewers are a godsend, and they will never know how much they've helped here. I'd like to say thank you to every one of them, and I appreciate what they have done. I can't believe that people are so kind, so generous. Before it was over, most of us realized, reporters and flood victims alike, we'd never been through anything like that before. Comparisons were made to other catastrophes, floods of 48 and 64, and suddenly we realized, were we to add a little music and the words of an anonymous poet, we'd have legend in the making. There'd been wind and snow and ice, but nothing ever like this. Who could know what was coming in the flood of 96? Quite suddenly, it was upon us, muddy water rising everywhere. Little time to make higher ground, pack a bag, or say a prayer. From Woodland to Mill City, Chehalis to Idana, Klatskanai, Vernonia, Centralia, and Kalama. It was the same everywhere. A lost home, a family business. Who could know what was coming in the flood of 96? But just when things were at their worst, something good started to be felt. Neighbors and friends and strangers came to say, hey, we can help. They came in goodly numbers. Teenagers volunteered, oldsters too, to rescue, shelter, or sandbag, whatever they could do. Even here in Portland, where things aren't like a small town, they walled off the waterfront, helped the whole city hold its ground. And again, it happened everywhere. Volunteers came out of the hills to help in Tualatin, Oswego, Corbett, Tiger, and Cedar Mill. It's not over yet, no way. For many, the hurting never ends, but we know we can get through it with a little help from our friends. And doesn't it always happen that even in the bad there's good, that whatever comes our way, people do what they should? And so we might say tonight, there's never been anything like this, but who could know what was coming in the flood of 96?